Ready? This is going to be so much fun. Uh, this is the Battle of Frenchtown. Now, if you were to look it up, you could look it up under the Battle of Frenchtown. It's not a particularly well-known battle. Uh, but also, it sometimes comes up as the Battles of Frenchtown because it went over a couple of days. Sometimes it's called the Battle of the Raisin River. Sometimes it's called the Battle of River Raisin or the River Raisin Massacre. Uh, it, it received a whole bunch of different names. The reason I chose it is because it happened just, the anniversary was just two days ago, which is kind of cool, on the 18th, and it's only 50 miles from where we're standing right now, which is kind of cool. And so it's, it's going to happen in Michigan. So that's why, randomly, late last night, I decided we were going to do this battle, uh, which meant I stayed up late, but that's fine because caring. So... This battle is going to occur January 18th through the 23rd. The battle itself doesn't occur all those days, but we'll explain what's happening. The issue about this is it's a part of the War of 1812, and we've already discussed the causes of the War of 1812 and generally what was going on. But uh, what's going to happen in this particular situation is you're going to have something happen to the city of Detroit. Detroit was super important to controlling trade in the entire Michigan Territory. Plus, this area right here was frozen, the Detroit River, so you could cross from Canada into what is today Michigan with relative ease. And what is going to happen is the city of Detroit is going to fall to a combined British and Native American force without a shot. Because uh, in Detroit, they're like, uh, we're just afraid that the Native people will massacre the population. And this was a, a common belief. And the reason it was a common belief was that the British would foster this idea. Uh, they had fostered this idea even in the American Revolution. Uh, you had Hare Buyer Harrison, I think was his name. He used to pay for American scalps. So what you had was this potential for brutality amongst the native peoples. And so this was a, a form of terrorism. Well, what's going to happen is when Detroit falls, it has to be retaken. And so a guy named William Henry Harrison, he was general, major general, uh, William Henry Harrison, who had already shown success in previous uh, battles, particularly with native peoples, he is going to take command. And he is going to embark on bringing the city, uh, and, well, the city was kind of a city, but bringing in Detroit and its fort back into American hands. And so what's going to happen is uh, William Henry Harrison is going to head north with his army and he's going to break it into two columns. He's going to command one column and a guy named Winchester is going to command the other column. The problem is Winchester was not a particularly good commander. He's just not, and you'll see why. Something else that you should know about. Uh, a, a substantial number of Kentucky militia headed up north also from Kentucky to be involved in this battle. And they brought with them, number one, summer clothing, which it was, was dumb because they're going to fight in February. They just weren't, they didn't know about it. Uh, but they also brought with them their rifles. Kentucky rifles are extremely accurate. Yes? So why did the major general have a general that wasn't as good? Good question. Often what happens in armies, particularly armies that aren't particularly uh, experienced, you're going to have people that become generals during peacetime that don't prove to be really good in times of war. That was Brigadier General Winchester. He would be a, a fine guy to have on a base, not a fine guy to have on a battlefield. And you never really know how people are going to respond until they face battle. 
and Winchester was a guy who'd never really faced battle to be able to really prove himself. So, what's going to happen is the Americans are going to head up north. They're coming down from here, they're heading up north. The column that was led by Winchester was moving pretty fast. And what's going to end up happening with the Kentucky Regiment with them? They're going to get to this location here, and they were cold, and they were hungry. Particularly the Kentuckians. They'd been walking forever. And the Kentuckians also were well known for being really brutal to any native people that they came across. So they already had a reputation for being mean to the native peoples. And as we talked about, there was already a confederation of native peoples under the Prophet and Tecumseh, and they're going to take, they're going to uh, be a very important part of this battle. Now, they're not, gentlemen, they are not physically present, but they're go their men are going to be there. So, what's going to happen is Winchester was given the order to stay close to William Henry Harrison. You wanted to be within an hour or so of each other in case one of them gets into trouble. Then you've only got to wait an hour to get there. Winchester went too fast. Essentially, he was about a, at least a half a day to a day ahead of William Henry Harrison's troops. So he's got to wait a day or more if he runs into trouble. And he runs into trouble. What's going to happen is the first battle of Frenchtown, because there were multiple battles of Frenchtown, the first battle of Frenchtown is going to occur when Winchester's men decide they're going to take Frenchtown. They wanted to take Frenchtown because Frenchtown had a whole bunch of supplies, winter clothing, and food. Just so you know, the Kentuckians had 10 bullets left each. Right? They had enough powder and enough bullets for 10 shots of their rifles. That's not a lot. Right? Think about it. If you can shoot an aimed shot every 30 seconds or so, and you've got 10 rounds, how long can you shoot? You've got five minutes. That's it. That's not a lot of time in a battle. Right? Battles usually aren't won and lost in five minutes. So, that, so they needed things. So they come in here. It was initially there were not only British soldiers here, British regular soldiers. There were also Canadian militia and native peoples here. They didn't expect the Americans to arrive. When the Americans arrived and they pushed through here, they were actually surprisingly successful. The British had cannon. They weren't able to effectively deploy them as much as they wanted to because they had to keep moving backwards. And so as the Americans were pushing forward and the British were like, oh my goodness, this is not what we'd expected. We weren't ready. And they started to fall back into this tree line. The Americans, sensing victory under a gentleman named Lewis, are going to continue, and they're going to push into the forest. What they ran into was native peoples who knew how to fight in the woods. According to the Americans who were there, what the native people would do, and the Canadians, is they would run away, hide behind a tree, reload, pop out, fire, run away, hide behind a tree, reload. And so it was very difficult for the Americans to get at them. And the native people were equally hard to get. They were just blending into the forest and running away. Because for them, it was smarter to leave the situation to fight again another day. The Americans just had a tactical advantage because they were ready earlier. So what's going to happen, the Americans should have realized they did not annihilate the British or the native people on day one. They didn't. They dispersed them into the woods somewhere north. But that was it. Here's the deal. William Henry Harrison hears about the battle, hears that it was a success, and says, great, 
hold your position, enforce your position, and we'll be there probably within a day or so. That's all you got to do. So all that Winchester had to do was hold the city. This is a regular city. There's buildings. There's a fence right here, road going through it, frozen river raisin. All he has to do is hold this city. If you were Winchester, what would you do to make it so your men were safe from counterattack? What would you do? Please. Would you set up like people, like set up ships around the uh, camp? Yes. You want to put, they're called pickets and sentries. And you want to put them around here so they can see if the enemy is coming. That's a brilliant plan. Did you have another idea? Uh, if the river is really frozen, you could just put people on there. I don't know. Yeah, you could, you could certainly use this as an easy way to move around because the river is going to be really fast. Because you, you could go all over the place and move around. Even this area over here would probably be frozen. So you could use the river as a, as a natural highway. Yeah. Is the ice thick enough that they can walk on it? Absolutely. They can even bring cannon across it. All right, so pickets, number one. Number two, you want to somehow have defenses, right? And so what normally a commander would do is say, dig in. Even if it's just a foxhole, dig a hole so that the enemy can't shoot at you. Now, the ground is frozen, so it's going to be hard. But this, there's a city here. You're going to be able to find shovels. You'll be able to find pickaxes. Even if it's just a hatchet, you could dig. And then what you can do is you take the soil that you dig to hide in, and you build up a berm in front of you, right? So that the enemy can't shoot you, and you have some way to defend yourself. But the problem is Winchester did not do this. He actually told his soldiers just to camp here in the middle, out in the open, put up your tents, sit there in the open. He did send out pickets, but not enough of them. So he put out some guards, not enough, and they weren't far enough out. They were just told, basically, stay awake, stay alert. The Kentucky contingent hid behind a fence that was here. So that was some protection, but they were still out in the open. Right? And then Winchester leaves. He found a really nice house he liked here that was three quarters of a mile away. So he's not at the battlefield at all. He's far away. So what's going to happen is the British are going to realize, oh my goodness, there are Americans coming to try to retake Detroit. So they're going to come from Canada, walk across the Detroit River with their army, and they're going to decide they're going to attack here. The guy that led them at the time uh, his name was, he was Colonel Proctor. And what's going to happen is he is going to bring his army that was not only British regulars, but also Canadian militia. And he's going to have with him uh, Native Americans. And many of the Native Americans that he has with him are actually mounted or on horses. So that's going to be a factor. Um, at this point, Winchester receives credible news that the British are coming. Have you heard that before? The British are coming. Winchester chooses not to believe them. These are people that live here. They're like, no, and they're mostly French. They're like, no, really, we, we know the British are coming. You got to be ready. And he chose not to believe that. That's a real problem. Also, Winchester did not give his troops access to ammunition. They just didn't have a lot of it. Yeah. So how did it take them less than a day to walk from Canada to where this is? Good question. 20 miles. You can do a forced march in 20 miles, and it takes a little over a day to do that. And that's why it starts on the 18th, ends on the 23rd. But wouldn't the other army like, be there by then if they said, hey, just wait, we'll be there in a day? Oh, uh, you're talking about William Henry Harrison's army. They were over here. Like, if this map continued, they were way over here. The, Cana the, the British in Canada were actually closer to the battlefield. 
And, and that's because Winchester went too far too fast. He was supposed to follow orders. Really good question. All right, so here's what's going to happen. Proctor is going to form up here. Watch this, All right? Uh, Proctor is going to have about 1,400 men against about 1,000 Americans. So they form up like this. In the center, you have a big group of regulars. These are British regular soldiers. On the left flank of the British, those are Native American allies on horses. On the right flank of the British, you have the Canadian militia. And what happens is, in the middle of the night, Proctor goes through the forest. And the sentries, the American sentries, don't notice them. They don't notice them until the battle is just about ready to start. As a matter of fact, one of the British who was there said, our line was formed within musket shot before they were aware. Meaning, this is 200 meters. They were already in this open field when the Americans realized, oh my goodness, the enemy is right there and we're not ready. And so very quickly, these guys grabbed their weapons, tried to get ready. One picket here did fire off the first shot and it, it woke everybody up. And it was 6 a.m. and the British are coming. This is a big deal. These guys have rifles and they're behind a fence. That's helpful. These guys are stuck in the open jumping out of their tents. Not a good scene. And so what's going to happen is the bulk of the British forces are going to go that way. These guys are going to move this way. The cannon that they initially had were initially here. And so the cannon are firing, the British are moving forward, and these guys are just barely holding their own. The Kentuckians are doing fine. In fact, the Kentuckians are doing really well. They're picking off the enemy because they've got rifles. What's going to happen is Proctor's going to make a decision that was actually a good decision. In this situation, if you are the British, what are you going to do to win this battle? Well, you, how are you going to kill them? Well, yeah, you're going to try to shoot them, but how are you going to utilize the troops that you have? You have one huge advantage. Yeah, and then I'll get you. The horses. Cavalry. Is that what you were going to say? I was going to say have the horses go behind. Absolutely. You're going to want to use the native people on horses because they move faster. And that's what they're going to do. Bam. The minute that these guys see they're being charged by British forces and there's cannon and they look behind them and there's like, oh, the Native Americans are back there. There's Shawnee, Ojibwa, Potomotomi, oh my goodness, Ottawa, Delaware, Miami, Winnebago, Creek, Sauk, and Fox. There's a whole bunch of them. And they're on horses. What are these guys going to do, naturally? Run. Yeah, they're going to run. Yeah. So does Bestie General like not know this is happening still? He's trying to get here. So the other oh, this guy, yeah, Winchester, when he hears the gunshots, they occur right at Reveille, which is when you wake people up with the bugle. The bugle was sounded to, sounding to wake people up, and that's when the British charged. So Winchester's like, oh my goodness. So he puts on his uniform over his night coat. It's so like over his pajamas. He puts his uniform on grabs his sword, and he rushes to the battlefield, which, which is what he should do. He heads this way. But as he's heading this way, what are these guys doing? Dying. They're dying and running. That's exactly what they do. These guys all run this way. He can't stop them. He's like, hey, stop. And they're like, uh, no. And they run this way. The problem is, who's chasing them? Horses. Are horses faster than people? Yes. Absolutely. And so what's going to happen? 
those guys are going to be stopped. The battle is continuing here. All right, so you got that. The battle is continuing here. What Proctor does is he makes a dumb decision, the British uh, commander. He says, hey, why don't we bring up our cannon and put it right here? Enfilade them or hit them from the side, flank them, and blow them up here. The problem is he was not familiar with Kentucky long rifles. They have a, they're extraordinarily accurate at really long ranges. These guys can easily hit a head-shaped target at 200 meters. Not a man-sized target. They can hit a, 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 like a melon at 200 meters. So you've got these guys bringing up cannon well within range of these guys' rifles. And so these guys just pick off all the guys shooting the cannons. Just destroy them. The Kentuckians are winning. They're like, we're winning. And they were. Except Winchester gets captured along with all these men. Winchester is stripped by the native peoples and they leave him in his nightshirt, right? Which later led to the, uh, a rumor that he was so unprepared he wasn't even wearing his clothes. That's not true. They stripped him of his clothing. But he's here. He's like, crap, I've lost. And so what he does is he sends a message to these guys to surrender. He sends it via the British. He says to the British, hey, we got to surrender. So what happens at 10 AM? These guys have been fighting. Get this. These guys have been fighting for four hours with about 10 bullets. All right. That's really picking your shots carefully. But some of it's hand to hand. It's messy, just messy. The Kentuckians are fighting unbelievably bravely. What happens is this. No one wants to attack the Kentuckians because they're really good shots. And so at 10 AM, Proctor sends a British uh, soldier with a white flag to go over here and talk to them. The Kentuckians think, oh, they're going to surrender because they thought they were winning. And what they received was a letter from Winchester telling them to put down their arms. And the Kentuckians are like, why would we quit fighting? We're winning. And then they said, we don't want to put down our arms because we don't trust the native peoples. They're going to try to kill us. Because remember, the Kentuckians had a reputation for being kind of brutal toward Native Americans. And so they're like, oh, we'd rather die fighting than be uh, mutilated and scalped. They didn't want that. So they decided they were going to keep fighting. And they did. They continued the battle until they ran, really, until they ran out of ammunition. And what's then going to happen is Winchester and all of his men, who are able-bodied, they're going to take them, the British, are going to take most of them as prisoners of war. And they're going to transport them up north. They didn't have enough sleds for the wounded. This is winter. And so what they did is any wounded Americans, they put wounded British people on sleds and took them to safety. Wounded Americans were left in some of the houses. And so were many of the prisoners of war. Well, here's the issue. And this is going to lead to something called the River Raisin Massacre. While the British were here, everything seemed fine for the Americans. Yep, they'd lost a battle. They were prisoners of war. No big deal. The British then decided they were going to leave with their wounded. Who did they leave with the Americans in charge of the Americans? The native people who are not happy with the Americans. So the native people waited for the British to leave. We don't know if there was a secret agreement or anything like that. It doesn't matter because once the British were gone, the native people started by stealing from the Americans, just taking all their valuables, then taking their clothing. And then they started to kill the injured. And they just said, hey, we can't march you anywhere because you're injured. And so they started scalping and tomahawking people in, that are injured in bed. You don't do this. This is, you're just not supposed to do this kind of thing. 
This went on. This was the massacre. We don't know how many died, maybe up to 100. Suffice to say, from this battle, only 33 guys made it to safety. 33 Americans made it to safety. The rest were either prisoners of war or they were killed. Some of them were killed in the march to prisoner of war camps. If they slowed down, they were killed by the native people. 33 out of how many? 33 out of about 1,000. This was the greatest loss of life ever in Michigan, number one, and it was the greatest loss of life in the Battle of 1812, or sorry, the War of 1812. This was a horrific American loss. That's part of the reason we don't know a lot about it. We like to learn about our victories. So here's the deal. What's going to eventually happen is the rest of America is going to learn about this horrific loss. The Kentuckians, people in Kentucky are going to hear about it, and they're going to be angry. And they started to raise a battle cry, remember the river Raisin. And people started to recruit more and more soldiers to fight the British. And what's eventually going to happen, in Lake Erie, we're going to build a navy. And we're going to eventually defeat the British with a navy that we created. It's really a cool thing. Yeah. Literally, had Winchester just done his job, he could have held out long enough, had reinforcements, and won the battle. But he didn't. And so William Henry Harrison was angry. Winchester did survive, but uh, as, a, as a prisoner of war. William Henry Harrison is going to, just so you know, become an American president, based in part on his stellar military career. But what's going to happen in the long run is we are going to remember the River Raisin, build up our forces, and then we're going to attack, by this time, Brigadier General Proctor. And we are going to defeat him eventually by moving into Canada and uh, attacking and taking him or taking his men prisoner. So we kind of got a little bit back after our loss at the Battle of Frenchtown. But here's the deal, guys. What this is going to lead to is a general idea that number one, the British can't be trusted. Like, that's just what we thought as Americans. We're going to get rid of that, and they're going to end up being our allies like they are today. What we never forgot as a people, to our chagrin, is we had this idea in our heads that no native people could ever be trusted, that they would always, when given the chance, massacre people. And so that is going to uh, influence our opinion Every time we moved west and came across a new group of native peoples that we hadn't come across before, we're going to treat them all as if they were horrific savages, and we are going to be extraordinarily brutal to all of them. And so it's, this battle is just going to be one reason why we are going to be brutal toward Native Americans in American history. Right. So... Thank you for listening to that battle. This was a tough one to do. It was really interesting. You guys had good questions, and you also had really good ideas. Had any of you been here in place of, of Brigadier General Winchester, we probably at least wouldn't have lost that battle so badly. All right? So thank you guys. Good job. Seriously.